Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tess Grinock, and I'm here with my colleague, Sally Gore. We're from the Research and Scholarly Communication Services team in the library, and we are excited to dive into some Excel charts today. Yay! Uh, but before we get started, we wanted to let you know that the slides and recording will be shared with everyone who signed up for today's workshop. So don't feel like you need to write everything down uh, if you do not want to. Uh, and if you have any questions at any point, please drop them in the chat. And we'll also leave some time at the end for questions as well. So at the end of today's workshop, uh, we hope that you'll be able to create a chart in Excel and incorporate best practices for data visualization into Excel charts. So how does one go about creating and choosing a chart, even before getting into Excel? So before you open up Excel, uh, you need to identify your question or goal. Uh, who the audience is for your results, whether it's a scientific audience, the public, or yourself. Uh, collect and analyze the data needed. Choose the appropriate visualizations to meet the needs of your question, audience, and data. And sometimes I find that sketching it out can really help, especially um, if I'm using a new tool. Having just, it's easier to sketch something out on a piece of paper than sometimes fiddling around with the tool that I'm using. And then when you get into Excel, uh, you're going to want to apply the good design concepts you're going to pick up today and edit as necessary. So there are a lot of tools to help you choose the appropriate chart, and we've displayed four of them here. So in the top left, we have Andrew Abella's Chart Chooser, which provides a nice decision tree to help you choose your chart. And the chart chooser from Juice Analytics in the bottom left focuses on charts in Excel and filters by type of visualization. My favorite is the data visualization catalog, which is in the top right, uh, because of how it, a visual it is, and you can filter by function. And if you're creating a chart with qualitative data, Stephanie Evergreen's qualitative chart chooser provides an array of great options and types of stories they can tell. So which chart chooser you want to use is entirely up to you. Uh, I would recommend checking them out and seeing which one you prefer. And once you've chosen which chart you want to use, there are many options for lines, shapes, colors, and sizes. And this chart gives a great breakdown of the effectiveness of different visual channels for both quantitative or ordered data and categorical data. So starting on with quantitative data, that uh, position on a common scale is the most effective. Uh, and then you get to down to uh, color, hue, and, and volume are some of the more least uh, less effective uh, visual channels. And then categorical data, the location where an item is in a chart is more effective than uh, the shape. So for today's demo, we want to create a chart to answer the question, how did the pandemic affect the tomato price spread from farm to consumers? So uh, what chart do you think we should choose for our data? And I've just taken a snapshot of the data and I'm gonna go ahead and I've got a quick poll for that and I'm going to start launch that. So what chart do you think we should choose? And if you choose other, type your response in the chat. All right, I think we pretty much got everybody. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So we've got almost an even split between a bar chart and a line chart, uh, which is great. And uh, nobody chose pie chart or scatter plot. Um, and that is great to see uh, because uh, some of the reasons why you don't wanna choose a pie chart is because uh, none of these, uh, this data is gonna be representing a whole necessarily. Uh, for our question, um, and uh, we're looking at something across time, so we want to try and uh, have a, a, a linear access and um, to track that over, and so a bar chart or a line chart uh, could work, and maybe even a combo, uh, so uh, giving a little bit of foreshadowing there. All right, so one of the first things uh, 
with Excel before you get into a, the chart itself is that you're going to want to put things uh, in order. So uh, now that we've decided the chart, we can move on to the ordering. And this can be uh, from highest to lowest alphabetically, and it goes for all tables and charts. So now I'm going to hand things over to Sally uh, for our demo. And so when we were thinking about finding a good data set, and if you maybe attended Tess's uh, workshop a few weeks back about how to find good data, um, you learned lots of different sources and ways to do that. And one that um, is good, lots of government sources. And just for their example today, I went to the USDA to see about um, food prices because that's the government agency that tracks those sorts of things. And we just chose the fresh tomatoes field grown and the Excel chart, basic things. It would download over here and I would open that up, but I already have it open. So I'm gonna quit that little share and I'm gonna go to this share. So we'll just go straight to the sheet. Okay, so this is the data set that came down. I admit less one little thing because I wanted to do a quick cleanup of it. It came down very nice and neat um, all year in order, which is how I wanted to see it. So I changed it just a little bit to show the point of just sometimes you have to do a little bit of cleaning. We were fortunate this time it came down like I wanted, but I can see here in this as it is right now, I've got the retail going, actually, no, it is all cleaned up, isn't it? Um, <laughs> the retail's going the way we want it. The, the years are going the way they want it. And if I needed to change that, I could just go over to the, the sum or the sorting function. And you can see it's sorting by year. Maybe if I wanted to sort by price, I could choose that. If I wanted to um, sort by the farm price as compared to the retail price, I could do that. But for our purposes of our um, exercise today, we're going to leave it sorted by year, lowest to highest or most recent. And again, you have this, if you wanna play around with it in your worksheet, you can do that while we're there. There's also a lot of other stuff on this um, screen right now too. Um, so I don't really wanna mess with all the text and I might need some of this text later. So I just copied over what I needed to a separate sheet, a worksheet within my um, workbook to make it easier. Now, it's interesting that everyone said they wanted they thought either a bar chart or a line chart would work for answering our question. And you're exactly right. And actually what would work even better is a combination of those two things as Tess um, alluded to. So when you highlight the variables that I wanna work with and I'm going to choose insert. And a lot of times what happens with um, Excel is it gives a number of recommended charts and we're really quick to just choose those. Here's a quick clustered column showing all three variables together. And it's really, let's just throw that up there and it would work great. But I'm gonna choose something a little different because I really, I wanna compare the prices more than anything. And then as a as kind of a third question, sort of look to see what the share, the farm share happened. So rather than any of these that Excel is recommending, I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna choose a combo chart, which will give me a line, which will give me the clustered columns for the prices and a line chart for my farm share. And it ends up looking just like this, exactly what I wanted. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger for our screen. And there we have it. So you can see the two clusters are here of the retail price, the farm price, and then we have a line showing the um, fluctuation in the farm share percentage over time. Back to you, Tess. Thanks, Sally. So now that we have our uh, chart created, we've chosen what chart we want, everything's in the order that we want. Uh, the next thing on our to-do list is using color effectively. So basically we'd want no more death by bar color. So uh, charts uh, in general are not the chance for you to paint with all the colors of the wind. Uh, and it's best practice to try and limit colors where possible. And one way that you can help limit colors is by labeling directly. So whether it is uh, having 
the labels at the bottom of your bars or having it at the end of a line. Uh, that'll help you reduce the number of colors that you have in your chart. You also want to try and ensure that you have a strong contrast with your background. And uh, this requires knowing where your image is going to appear. Is it going to be a white background? Is it going to be dark background? Is it going to be next to the school logo or another image that you want to make sure that it plays nicely with? And one uh, tool that can help you uh, make sure that you're choosing the best palette for your chart uh, is Color Brewer 2, uh, which is a tool uh, to generate uh, palettes. And it was designed for maps, uh, as you can see by this map here. Uh, but it's also great for other charts as well. And you can indicate the number of data classes that you have and the type of data and also just color schemes and let you know if they are colorblind friendly and photocopy, LCD, and print friendly. You can also use color to highlight. So this case here, uh, we're highlighting the increase in the number of part-time faculty, uh, or you can use color to group. So using that same data, but this time I use the same color for all the groups that are increasing and all the groups that are decreasing. And so this highlights that the number of full-time tenured and tenure track faculty are decreasing. And when choosing colors, there's many places you can draw inspiration from from uh, you, an image using a color picker to find the hex code or RGB code to put that into Excel. Uh, you can also use uh, pre-tested color gradients from the aforementioned color brewer or also a favorite is uh, Carto Color, which is also linked on the slide. And you can also use a single color or group of colors as inspiration to create your palette. So uh, there is a few links to some palette builders uh, that are helpful as well. But it's important to keep in mind that colors have different meanings and can change across cultures. And one can see this most often in company logos. So the color red is often associated with passion and love and blood and excitement. So it's seen in a lot of logos for food and entertainment. So things like Coca-Cola, Dairy Queen, Netflix, CNN, uh, whereas blue is seen as trust and calm. And it's seen in communication, healthcare, and bank logos, such as Visa, IBM, and Bell. And green is seen for growth. So it's often seen in a lot of nature-related and bank logos, such as TD, John Deere, and Land Rover. So if possible, take advantage of predefined color meanings, such as uh, blue for water bodies. <laughs> and your data will also dictate uh, your color choice to some extent as well. So especially when it comes to color scales. So for quantitative data or ordered qualitative data, you'll want to use a sequential or diverging color scale. And these are binned or split into brackets or continuous. Uh, and our ordered qualitative data should only be used uh, using binned scales. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, and these can be, for a sequential, they can be from dark to light or light to dark and uh, have a single or multiple hues. And whereas diverging is usually dark in one hue and then goes to light uh, to dark in a different hue. And you would only wanna use that diverging color scale if there's a meaningful middle, middle point. And then uh, qualitative uh, data, you will want to use a categorical color scale. So different hues with, and they can be with different lightnesses as well. So they work in grayscale. And back to you, Sally. Thank you, Tess. So let's look back at our chart here that we have, and we have three colors tossed in there for our three variables, all chosen by Excel. And uh, going along with what Tess, uh, one of the topics or reasons to use color is to highlight something. I am looking at a question about um, the COVID, the year 2020, 2020, 2021, but we'll stick with 2020 is what I want, I'm wondering, did tomato prices go up a lot? Um, food prices have certainly gone up about tomatoes um, along the line. And so I'm gonna take advantage of color to highlight that in the story that I'm gonna tell. But the first thing I wanna do is I'm looking at years and I'm thinking, uh-oh, I don't have any years here on my axis. I just have the um, sequential numbers going across. So I wanna change that real quickly to include the, to make this be a year. So I'm you click on the axis or the numbers category and you right click on it, you'll see a menu that pops up 
And what I want to do here is select the data that's associated with this horizontal axis. And so you see I have lots of options here, but this one, the horizontal category axis label is blank. So if I click on the little box, it looks like an Excel spreadsheet. And I go over and I just going to click and hold and drag down to capture all of the years. And then choose OK. You'll see it changes. Now my axis is showing the years. So now I know which one of these is a 2020 data for when I'm going to do coloring. So uh, along with uh, color, the other uh, part, big part of the content that you'll probably want to change is the text. And some pointers to keep in mind for the text is to keep it horizontal and to annotate figures directly to highlight key points in the chart and to use descriptive titles. So once uh, we have our uh, data in the color that we want and um, with the text that we want and how we would like it, uh, the next uh, thing that we'll want to do is to remove any uh, chart junk. So some of the things that you could do to help decolor clutter it are to um, remove uh, the legend, for example, uh, perhaps removing the lines that, that you don't need. Maybe there are, uh, maybe that adding an axis if it's not there. And then adding data labels and maybe taking some of those away so that you can highlight a particular point. Just going to highlight this, right click so that I can um, format my data series, get my box to open. I'm going to mute these colors as I so said I was going to start to do just a few minutes ago before the IT thought better. Um, I'm going to mute this probably to more of like a um, uh, nope, a, like a grayish color, just to sort of make everything kind of muted so that now I can um, really highlight this year 2020, which is probably what test showed too as well. So when you double click on it to isolate that one, I'm going to choose red because we're talking about tomatoes. I'm going to do the same with this one, double click. I'll give it like a dirt color and all kinds of matches there. Um, some other things we're going to do, the chart title, I'm going to move over here because eventually I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to add my labels. And again, I'm sorry if I'm repeating some things, but you can kind of just sort of follow along. Adding that, just covered this already. Let's click the whole series. Again, right click, add the labels. So I have those uh, directly over and then cleaning up because I know that that was some here. So I, one thing I don't need because I'm going to, um, I don't really need the axis here to tell the numbers because I have the labels directly. So I'll just highlight that and delete it. And it looks a lot cleaner already. Um, I'm going to uh, describe, I'm going to take advantage of this big plot of space up here to talk about this. So I don't really even need the farm, these, um, legend there, the key, make it a little bit bigger again. And then one thing that I like to do with Excel um, as well is that the bars are always um, skinny just on their own. So one way that you can kind of give them a little bit of heft to stand out is again, just single click on them so that we're formatting our data series. And if you choose the box that looks like the data uh, or the columns, you'll get a chance to do the series overlap and the gap width. The gap width is what will make your lines um, wider. So if you shrink it down, um, maybe all the way to like 25 in this instance, you can see it lets our lines stand out a little bit more. And it also helps um, your, your labels. If you wanted to put labels inside, you need your, your columns of course need to be wide enough so that the, um, the numbers will fit in there, the labels will fit in there. Um, if you chose to do that. And I don't need this axis anymore, so I can get rid of that. I'm getting lots of space and lots of room to do things. Um, 
let's see, what were we going to do? So I want to tell the story. And the story I want to show is that if you do look at the data, it's not a huge jump, but it is the highest price um, of tomatoes in the past almost 30 years was during 2020. Um, amazingly, they came back down the following year, 2021. Um, not a big thing, but you can, what we can do is we can say that in our chart title, we can say the, the retail price of fresh tomatoes and it's cents per pound so that people know what we're our measurement. Oops. Was the highest any other time during the past 30 years, something along these lines. You're telling a story so that it will go along. And then as well, the farm, the farm price was also as high, right? The farm price, so I could even say the retail and farm price, looking at it. And I can also look just quickly and see that there's not, and I, granted I haven't, we're, this is a very brief demo and we didn't do a great deal of analysis with any, we didn't do any analysis with this data, but um, it looks kind of relatively flat over the period of time. So we could just, even if we wanted for the sake of the demonstration, we could say the farm share percentage has remained relatively stable. Now I'm gonna use color again to sort of highlight uh, and reinforce my message. So when I'm talking about, because I got rid of the legend, when I'm talking about the retail price, I'm talking about the red. So I can easily highlight this retail price. I can go to the home screen and the color, and I can just make the, the um, font color of that to match the color of my bar. I can also make it bold so it stands out a bit more. Do the same thing with the farm price. And now I don't necessarily, people with your eye and we're, when we're reading things, um, we can make that, that leap between the two. The farm share is our green line. So I'll just do the exact same thing there with that. I'll turn it green and I'll make it bold. Now there, again, there's some other things we talked about in terms of making sure your colors um, are things that everyone can read and they're accessible to everyone. And so green and red are not always your best choices with this. Um, so you'd wanna do some work with that. A few other things, um, and I was sure Tess, if you, did you show about moving labels in different places? Did not. Okay, so um, you might see sometimes you like your labels um, above the chart to make it easy. Again, you can put them in different places in Excel. You just click on them, go over to your label options, and we're looking at the labels here. So it's under, always just remember there's lots of options and you just click till you find the one you're looking for. We're looking for label options. And you can see I can put it different places. The default is the outside end, but maybe I want it on the inside. If I chose something like that, then I know I'm going to have to do something with this particular one because you can't read that very well. So I would just go up and I would change that to a white font to make it stand out more. The same with these. Just if you do it multiple times, you eventually get good at it. Put them inside and I make sure I'm just isolated that one and I'll do the same so that those numbers fold out. I would probably, if I was spending more time with this, I would make these maybe, a, they're pretty small already, so I'd probably widen out my bars just a little bit more. And then one other label that we want to put in is we don't, people don't necessarily know what this green line represents. I've said farm share up here, but I want to label it directly. So if I isolate this one point right here that I want, and I'm going to format this data point, and I'm going to add Oops, nope, I'm not going to right click on it once it's totally done. And I'm just going to add a data label just to this one point. I didn't want them all. I just wanted that one. And now I want to format this one because it's 36. It's pulling 
from some other number and I want to make it um, the options. And so right now it's showing the, um, it's not really showing anything, but what I want to make it is the series name, which is farm share. So I'll just, oh darn, that did that to me again, didn't it, Tess? <laughs> we were doing this earlier today and it was doing that. I don't want to care about seeing the value and I don't really need the letter leader line. I just need this. Now, it's all kind of crowded. So you can always grab the plot area and pull that in a little bit. Now the farm share shows over here on the outside. You could even if you wanted to make it stand out a little bit more, you could use color again. You could go back to your home. You can fill in that bucket with that same green. And that makes it match up a little more. So kind of like that. I did take a few moments. I did a different way um, of kind of showing the same um, effect. And that's your third tab. Again, Tess sent this out to everyone earlier. But if you look in the third tab, there's another type of chart you can do, which is an overlapping bar chart. Um, this doesn't give us the farm share. I wasn't uh, looking at that in this particular one. That's that's not something I want to convey to people. I just really wanted to show the spread between the prices of retail price and um, farm price. And you can do that uh, doing something called a um, uh, overlapping bar chart, which is basically the cluster bar. And what you can't see is there's a second axis over here, which is sort of pulled the two bars together. But just to show there are lots of different things you can do in Excel besides out the out of the bucket um, options that always seem to um, get chosen a lot. <laughs> now I gotta get back out. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sally, for and coming back. Um, the, uh, so now that we have uh, created our lovely chart, um, the last sort of piece is wherever you are putting your final chart is that you want to make sure that you are citing the data uh, that you used in your chart. So this is an example of the data citation for the data set that we we're using today. And uh, Using this is using the general format of author, year, and then a title uh, and publisher and access information. Uh, so, and you should be also citing data that if it's your own as well. And this helps readers find the original data source as well as increases the legitimate legitimacy of your chart. And uh, if there's a site a suggestion for how they would like the data cited, uh, you can copy that or uh, use the preferred citation style, which is outlined on this slide. And uh, so as Sally was mentioning, that there was some extra information added into the data set that uh, when it was originally downloaded from the USDA. And part of the reason why you might want to keep that with the chart and create your chart on a different, a separate tab is so that you can have that information to be able to put that into a data citation later. So we've created uh, our, our lovely visualization, but why do we want to visualize even in the first place? So part of the reason is to see patterns. So this is, uh, the classic ex example is Anscombe's Quartet, which is uh, for uh, charts which have almost identical summary statistics for X and Y variables. So it's the mean, variance, correlation, and linear regression. Uh, but when they're plotted, they create much different patterns. It can also be used to tell a story like we did today. And uh, you'll often see charts in media like this visualization of power failures across the Northeast after Hurricane Sandy. And a data visualization can also have a stronger impact than a single number, like the 11,356 gun deaths in the US in 2018, which was transferred into this beautiful and heartbreaking animation visualization by Periscope, each line representing a single person's life cut short by a gun. And this is one example of the power of visualizations to move people. But they can also be used to inform and advocate, but also to mislead. So there are several reasons why you may want to visualize your data. So to help analyze large quantities of data, embed in papers or articles to help explain your research, 
used as a medium to deliver a message, narrative, or story, uh, for data-driven support for research or funding applications. But before you visualize, you need to have a purpose, what the questions you're trying to answer, an audience, what is it, yourself or funders or a boss or coworkers, uh, a plan or a sketch of and what type of charts would work best for answer your questions and what variables do you need to make those charts and time to clean the data, prep the data, sketch out the visualization and build the visualization and assess and modify. <laughs> and if you don't need a chart, save yourself some time and don't make one. <laughs> Sometimes a number or, a, uh, or text is better. Uh, so the example here, uh, we wrote out the main finding from a time spent survey. So 46% of librarian time is spent on reference services. Even though the half circle is not exactly 46%, it gets the point across. So keeping in mind the impact of visualization can have, it's important to visualize responsibly and use our visualization powers for good. So uh, some things to realize is that there's some common errors that are introduced uh, using distortion into a chart. So some of the common ones are 3D charts, uh, which can distort area. So adding a three-dimensional effect can make uh, parts of the chart look larger than they are uh, in uh, proportion to other portion pieces. Uh, so for example, in this pie chart here, the bottom uh, section of the pie chart is large take up a larger amount of area so it makes it gives a perception that the bottom piece is larger than uh, the ones near the top and so this can uh, whereas uh, if, if you stay in the two dimensions you can see that the orange slice is actually larger even if uh, marginally than the yellow slice and it's easier to see like how close they are in size uh, so if you are not uh, graphing 3d data do not use a 3d chart also, uh, axis should always start at zero. And so this uh, makes sure that we're not disproportionately uh, showing a difference. Uh, also, trying to, even though uh, it looks cute to use a picture in a bar chart, uh, these can often distort uh, the increase in the uh, difference uh, between, a uh, between options or between the bars. So for, for example, here, uh, I just briefly showed that, so in this example, they were try trying to show that A was three times larger than, uh, uh, sorry, three, B was three times larger than A, but it, by using the graphic, it actually takes up the same space as nine of the smaller uh, characters. Also, uh, a common distortion that happens from Excel charts uh, is uh, gaps, especially in dates or years. Uh, if dates or years are coded as uh, text variables, um, the Excel will not always pick up that it's uh, a date and needs to leave extra space. Uh, for example, uh, here, uh, 1970, the gap between 1975 and 1989 is much larger than the two-year gap between 2009 and 2011. And so uh, it was, it's not able to pick up on like the differences in the spacing. And uh, it's important to make efforts to make sure that everyone is able to understand your chart. So part of that is adding alternative text to graphics. And a good way to write this is uh, writing the, the chart type of the type of chart and then filling in the reason for including the chart. So for the chart that I have on the right, uh, it would be something along the lines of a bar chart of the number of cookies eaten by librarians where Tess has eaten more cookies than the other librarians, Adam, Matthew, and Zara. Another thing to keep in mind is to use accessible font uh, and to provide a raw data table and include a link to the data source somewhere in the text. You can even make the table really small. You just saw it disappear. Uh, and uh, if you're worried about the visual aesthetics of your product, um, you can even make it uh, blend in with the background. Also, you want to try and use the built-in style settings for charts. So for example, for Excel, using the title box to insert the title uh, and using the axis labels for, for the axes and not inserting a text box to put those in. Uh, and this is helpful because screen readers know that those are uh, the title and axis labels respectively. And you also want to make sure that you have enough contrast uh, in your colors. So. Um, uh, I just being mindful of time. All right, 
quick time check. I think we're good. All right, before I get into this section. So uh, just as a research question should determine the correct data to collect or use, the data set should drive choices about the visualization. And it's important that the inherent properties of data set are matched to the visualization. So that the visualization supports the same arguments that are supported by any statistical analysis of the data. And so uh, the first word of caution uh, when creating a visualization based on your data set is to consider whether the data are really comparable. So uh, sometimes our data includes raw values or absolutes, like the total number of unemployed people in a country, county or the total number of money donated by alumni from different schools and a university. And we share those data without any context. We may miss important information, like total number of people in those counties or the number of alumni who graduated from those different schools. By normalizing these data sets uh, by population, you can look at the true spatial patterns and locations where the occurrence of some particular phenomenon is greater or less than what you would expect from the size of its population. And it's important to be careful when visualizing just part of the data. Sometimes limiting the data supports a false conclusion or one that doesn't hold when viewing the full data set. It's also important to follow best practices for statistical analysis when considering the impact of outliers. Outliers can be inconvenient in visualization, but if you wouldn't remove the outliers from a statistical analysis, it may be distorting the message by removing them from the visualization. So um, for this example, uh, was created to help John Carter, a competitive race car driver, to decide whether the driving conditions, specifically cold weather, had an impact on the amount of uh, damage seen to the engine after an engine blowout. And looking at the graph, the pattern looks uh, between cold and weather and damage uh, and uh, hot weather damage isn't perfectly clear. Yes, the lowest temperature has the most damage, but the highest temperature also has quite a bit of damage. Uh, and this chart doesn't really explain what is happening when the engine blows out. And it doesn't really help John make the decision about whether or not to race in cold weather. Is cold weather really not a factor? Well, one of the chart that John Carter reviewed was this one. In this chart, the races with engine blowouts in red are contrasted with the races without blowouts in blue. And when the chart includes only the races with blowouts, we don't have enough context to understand whether there are also races that go well at the temperature. And with the full data set, we see that no races below 65 degrees have gone well. And with this additional context, racing at temperatures below 65 degrees can be correctly interpreted as much riskier than races at higher temperatures. But these visualizations aren't uh, actually really about racing. Uh, in truth, this pair of visualization was constructed as a case study by business professors Brittain and Sitkin in 1990. And the data points are actually taken from space shuttle launches and were presented when trying to decide whether to launch the Challenger shuttle, which famously and tragically exploded soon after launch because of the weather-related failure of the O-rings. And sometimes focusing just on one part of the data, even if that is part you are trying to predict and understand has disastrous consequences. So just like the John Carter example shows, it is often a complicated blend of visualization type, amount of data and thoughtful division of the data that shows us the most important patterns. And while it's tempting to think that the full data set is showing the most truthful explanation of relationship between variables, the Simpsons paradox actually challenges that idea. So in the maps, uh, I think I actually challenges that idea. And so uh, part of that is uh, you, for example, looking on the chart on the left, you'll see th that uh, the correlation between the two variables, it seems to be a positive relation. But if we look at uh, the three different groups that are within those, uh, that data, it actually shows a negative correlation for each of those groups. So with any data visualization project, it's important to let the data speak for themselves and drive the visualization. And I am, since we are running out of time, I just wanted to impart this last one to beware of oversimplifying variations uh, and being conscious of how you are binning your data, as well as keeping in mind that numbers are placeholders of real life people, data, uh, and occurrences, and that I'm, I'm going to leave you with this quote that uh, a chart doesn't make something true, data doesn't make something true, it bends and it shows many things, so keep your eyes open. 
And if you'd like to learn more about data visualization, we've put together this resource guide, uh, which has videos and other resources for learning and keeping up with data visualization innovations. And rounding out our last uh, library seminar series for researchers, this academic year uh, is the comparison uh, workshop, uh, uh, companion workshop to this one where we cover creating charts in R using ggplot2. And it's capped at 20 people uh, with a wait list. So uh, please only sign up if you're able to attend. And if there's enough interest, I will host uh, more workshops and I'll post the link for that in the chat. And uh, the recordings for the past seminars and workshops are on that seminar series page, putting that link in the chat. And that brings us at the end of our session. So uh, if you, uh, we would greatly appreciate if you have a moment to fill out this brief uh, two question feedback survey. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And it helps us to improve these courses and become better instructors. And so in our last eight minutes or so, uh, I didn't see any questions coming in the chat, but if you have any now, I'm going to stop the recording uh, and uh, open up if you would like to ask those questions live.